course, uh, to uh, the destruction uh, wrought on Ukrainian towns and cities by those relentless uh, attacks from Russia. The shelling and airstrikes on those civilian areas has been a tactic previously used by Moscow and Chechnya and Syria to try and break the will of local populations. The Ukrainian government has also accused the Russians of blocking aid supplies, trying to get into besieged cities and refusing uh, humanitarian corridors. Well, we're joined now by Air Marshal Philip Osborne. He's a former Chief of Defence Intelligence and a Director at Universal Defence and Security Solutions. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. We're three weeks now into this invasion. What is the current state of Putin's troops? I think it's fair to say... Um... They're pretty demoralised, pretty stark, and they're pretty stalled, actually. Um, they're demoralised because they were poorly prepared uh, and they've been proven to be um, inadequate. I think that's putting it mildly. Um, they're stalled because they've lost momentum. So we're seeing them pull resources, manpower from across Russia, even from Syria. Uh, that's, that's not a good indication for a you know, supposed superpower. And they're stalled because they're running out of options. Um, and really what's left to them now is to, is to double down on brute force, um, to put pressure on the Ukrainian government. You see, this is the worry, I guess, isn't it? Um, that even if the Ukrainian resistance has been more than anyone could have anticipated, even if the Russian forces are demoralised, do you think it is brute force that we're going to see more of? Um, I think it is. Um, Russia's tried to be agile, and that's failed. It wasn't up to it. Um, so now it's faced with how does it how does it get the Ukrainian government to settle on terms which are far more favourable uh, to to Russia to Putin. I mean, this is all about Putin, um, and therefore the way they apply apply pressure to the Ukrainian government is to you know level cities, um, to bring in huge artillery. Um, to try and generate that humanity, humanity and pressure, just not on the government, but also on the West. So, are you worried that Putin could start using weapons that we don't usually see uh, in, in these kind of fields of conflict? Um, chemical weapons, for example, even the so-called, like, you know, test of a nuclear? Well, how far could it go? I think... I think we'll see more conventional firepower first. Mm -hmm. um, Russia has huge artillery stocks. Um, and this is now a long, drawn-out conflict. And they um, can be devastating as well, right? Exactly right. Um, so, so we will see lots of conventional, but the risk of more unconventional, whether it be chemical, whether it be bio, whether it be even nuclear, that risk must be higher. Um, we come back to Putin does ha doesn't have many military options, and they're his, therefore his options to escalate are narrower. And, of course, this has an impact on how the West responds. It does. Um, the, West, the West has got a challenge. Um, it has got to strike the balance between trying to deter behaviour without excessively escalating. So this is a really difficult tightrope to walk. Um, but, but we have to be strong, we have to be resolute. Putin does not respect weakness. He sees us as weak, he sees us as de decadent. He knows that every time he pushes us, we take a step back. So he will have been surprised by um, the overwhelmingly strong sanctions that have been levelled against him. He'll be surprised by the willingness of the West to support the Ukrainian government and their armed forces. But it's not enough. Um, so there's something about the West needing to reset what it means about strength and resolution in order to deter further aggression. So what does that mean in practical terms? What do you think we should do? So there's a thing for the UK and there's a thing for, for the West more broadly. Um, the West needs to, be, needs to be less trivial. It needs to be more strategic. It needs to be more resolute in the way that we've seen over the last few weeks, but we weren't seeing over the previous 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I think the integrated review from a UK perspective is a good start. Um, but what this demonstrates is that security isn't about sound bites, it's about doing difficult things and being focused on maintaining those difficult things. So, so the integrated review, yes, is a good start. We need more mass and capability. That's probably more in the unmanned space, probably. Um, we certainly need more 
um, digital capabilities, and we and we need really as a nation to be more resilient. Um, that's both physically: can we defend ourselves uh, in the virtual space? Can we? Are we good at cyber resilience? But also in in the way we are, you know, the strength of our society. What what do we feel? The most important thing, though, is is we've got to go quickly. This. This is a wake-up call. And if you look at the integrated review, it has a 10-year horizon. That is too long. Do we need more money? I, it was interesting when I spoke to the Chancellor earlier, he was just talking about the money that he'd already given uh, to the Ministry of Defence, and I got the very clear Im impression that we shouldn't expect any more. Um, and <clears throat> the, the Chancellor will make the decisions that he needs mm -hmm. to make. If you ask somebody who did uh, nearly 40 years uh, in the UK military, um, sinusoidal application of investment is no good for it. Mm. So it needs sustained investment to allow us to protect the nation, but also from a UK military point of view to take its part in a far more strengthened NATO. Um, for Germany to commit 100 billion euros in one year, mm. I think indicates the scale of the challenge that all Western nations follow. And the UK, I'm sure, would want to play its part. Um, I just want to uh, draw us back to the situation that we're seeing unfolding in Ukraine. The bombardment has been pretty relentless and it seems that we should expect more <laughs> of the same. How long, realistically, do you think the Ukrainians can withstand this? Um, they have been amazing. Um, but we need to bear in mind that they, they've been preparing for this. This, for most of the West, started three weeks ago. For Ukraine, this started nearly a decade ago. That's a good point. Um, so they've had time to prepare, to think. It's that resilience that I was talking about. Um, they've also got a strength of will and the application of good weaponry, which I think we're seeing. Um, frankly, I think they will hold out as long as we can supply them mm -hmm. and as long as their morale holds up. Mm -hmm. And those are two very easy things to say. Uh, but really challenging to do. But focusing on supporting a brave people, do what's right for them, has to be one of those things that the West does to show strength and resolution. And um, President Zelensky has said that it's time to talk. He's called on Russia to get around the table and to try and find a diplomatic solution. Um, in the UK, our Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has effectively said she doesn't trust Russia, she thinks it could be a smokescreen to allow Russia to regroup and then carry out more attacks. What is your sense about how optimistic you are that any of these talks could actually lead to some kind of solution? Um, I'm quite pessimistic in the short term. Mm. Two things have to line up. Uh, Ukraine has to be comfortable to give something up. Which, to be honest, with our interview with the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister, she said that that was absolutely off the table. And you can understand why that's the case, because mm. thousands of Ukrainians are laying down their lives as we speak for that, for that sense of self. Mm. So the what is Ukraine prepared to give up and what is Putin prepared to accept from the perspective of a paranoid individual, until those two things get close, then there won't be an agreement. And I can't see those things getting close soon. Mm. Um, I understand the pessimism um, that you have. Just finally, Ukraine is also asking for other countries to effectively act as security guarantors for any peace deal. So effectively, if they end up agreeing to not join NATO and they sign some kind of deal, they want the assurance that they will be backed up if Russia tries to invade again in the future or so on. Do you think the UK should be prepared to give that assurance to Ukraine? And what, what would that mean? Uh, the Ukraine has a security guarantee already. It was given in 1994 mm -hmm. by the US, the UK and Russia. Mm -hmm. And where are we now? So if I was a Ukrainian, I'd want to be really clear that those security guarantees were cast iron and yeah. more cast iron than they were 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, those type of things, I'm sure, will have to be part of a solution. But if I was a Ukrainian, I'd want to see the colour of people's money. And that brings you back to resolution and meaning what you say, mm. not going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Really interesting to talk. And thank you so much for being on the programme uh, today.